In this segment, we're going to be talking about the 2009 IECC's organization, its scope, uh, its administration, and the residential requirements. Now, first of all, let's take a look at the table of contents. Chapter 1 is administration, which is scope and application, as well as administration and enforcement. Uh, chapter 2 are the definitions, which are really important to become familiar with. Uh, chapter 3 are the climate zones. There are climate zone maps and tables to kind of see where we fit in, into the zone. And in Kentucky, we're in climate zone 4. Um, also, we'll be looking at design conditions, materials, systems, and equipment. Now, chapter 4 is the residential energy efficiency requirements. Chapter 5 are the commercial building energy efficiency requirements. And chapter 6 are the reference standards. Now, the scope and general requirements. First of all, what does the code apply to? What is the uh, chapter four in particular uh, to the residential buildings? Well, number one, it's one to three stories above grade. It's R2, R3, R4 occupancy classification as defined as the IBC section 310. Uh, in general, it's low rise apartments, single family homes, duplexes, small residential care facilities. Now note the IRC uh, which is the International Residential Code, does have an energy component to it. It only applies to uh, single-family duplexes and townhomes. Now, within the IRC, which is the general building code, uh, there is a, a section on energy efficiency. It's the idea was to have all the code into one code book. Now, keep in mind that they're, they're very similar. There's a few differences, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But uh, in general, the IRC, with regards to requirements, applies to single and uh, duplex and townhouses. The IECC applies to all the things that I'm referring to here. So, for example, de defined residential building is defined in the IECC under definitions for this code includes R3 buildings as well as R2 and R4 buildings three stories and less in height above grade. IBC Chapter 3. Use and occupancy classification 310 definitions are as follows. R2. Residential occupancies containing sleeping units or more than two dwelling units where the occupants are primarily permanent in nature, including apartments, uh, boarding houses, uh, non-transient, uh, convents, dormitories, fraternities, sororities, hotels, uh, non-transient uh, live-work units, uh, monasteries, motels, non-transient, uh, of course, uh, vacation and timeshare properties. Now, uh, congregate living uh, facilities with 16 or fewer occupants are permitted to comply with the construction requirements for Group 3. Now, our three residential uh, occupancies are where the occupants are primarily permanent in nature and are not classified as Group 1, Group 2, R4, or I, including buildings that do not contain more than two dwelling units, uh, adult care facilities that provide accommodation for five or fewer persons of any age uh, for less than 24 hours, child care facilities that provide accommodations uh, for five or fewer persons of any age for less than 24 hours, or congregate living facilities with 16 or fewer persons. Our four residential occupancies shall include buildings arranged for occupancy as residential care, assisted living facilities, including more than five but not more than 16 occupants, including staff. So you may be wondering how mixed uh, use buildings are handled under the code. Well, mixed occupancies, uh, you treat the residential occupancy under the residential code, uh, the appropriate code, of course, and you treat the commercial section or occupancy under the commercial section of the code. So for example, as in this illustration, if you have residential apartments above a commercial uh, structure or commercial space, like a restaurant, then the uh, apartments fall under the residential code and the uh, restaurant would fall under the commercial code. Uh, also, it's important to recognize that additions and alterations fall under the new uh, 2009 IECC. So renovations or repairs to an existing qualifying building uh, or building system or any portion of either. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, if you are adding on an addition, that whole addition would fall under the new 2009 IECC in terms of the energy requirements. Unaltered portions of the buildings and systems do not need to comply. Now, um, in terms of what this means, 
uh, you conform as it relates to the new construction. So additions can comply either alone or in combination with the existing building. Now some exceptions, if you're just replacing your storm windows um, over existing uh, fenestration, it, you know, uh, that's an exception. Glass only replacements, existing uh, ceiling wall or floor cavities that are exposed during construction, if already filled with insulation, they're exempt. Uh, if they're not, do they don't have insulation in, then you should fill them with insulation. Um, construction where the existing roof or wall or floor cavity is not exposed, they're exempt. And of course, re-roofing for roofs where neither the sheathing nor the insulation is exposed. These are things that are exempt. So what are the exceptions to the code? Well, under Chapter 1, Part 1, Section 101, uh, some buildings that are exempt. Number one, uh, historic buildings. Number two, very low energy use buildings that are less than 3.4 BTUs per hour per square foot. And then three, uh, buildings that are neither uh, heated or cooled. Now, another important area that we need to pay close attention to are the definitions. And there are a few definitions that we're going to talk about here that are, I consider pretty important. Uh, number one, what is conditioned space? And number two, uh, what is the building envelope or building thermal envelope? As you can see in this diagram here, we have a red dashed line. Well, that is the building's thermal envelope. And what the uh, conditioned space is, is the space within that thermal envelope that's conditioned. And what separates condition for non-conditioned space, in other words, conditioned space is the space that we have to heat or cool, and the non-conditioned spaces are spaces that we do not. And the thermal envelope divides the spaces between those two, and the thermal envelope is really what the code addresses. What we're trying to accomplish here is to keep the cool air in in the summer months and the warm air in in the winter months. So the building envelope is basically what separates those two spaces, conditioned and non-conditioned spaces. Okay, so here's an example of a thermal envelope. Um, and what we're addressing in the code is uh, this dark uh, red area that we see here. And uh, we can see that the attic would be considered unconditioned space in this diagram and the rest of the area within that building envelope as conditioned space. So what the code really addresses in a lot of detail is really, uh, number one, fenestration, which is windows and doors and skylights. Uh, fenestration comes from the French word fentra. Uh, ceilings. Uh, walls, which are uh, walls fall as above grade, below grade, and mass walls. Mass walls are walls like solid masonry or concrete walls uh, that have the, the capacity to store energy. That's why they call them mass walls. And then finally, floors, slabs, and crawl spaces. Those are areas that we have to pay particular attention to in making sure that these buildings comply uh, with the code. Here are a few other definitions that can be difficult to understand and apply correctly. High efficiency lamps. High efficacy lamps consist of light emitting diodes or LEDs, compact fluorescent lamps or CFLs, T8 or smaller diameter linear fluorescent lamps, or any lamp that meets or exceeds the lumens per watt calculations specified in Chapter 2. Now, Chapter 2 tells us for any lamp over 40 watts, that lamp shall provide at least 60 lumens per watt. Then for lamps over 15 watts and up to and including 40 watts, the lamp shall provide at least 50 lumens per watt. Finally, for lamps 15 watts or less, the lamp shall provide at least 40 lumens per watt. Here's a quick example. A typical 40 watt incandescent bulb uses 40 watts of energy to produce about 490 lumens. So, the efficacy of this bulb is 490 divided by 40 or 12.25 lumens per watt nowhere near the 50 lumens per watt required by code. On the other hand, a 40 watt equivalent LED uses about 6 watts to produce 450 lumens or about 75 watts per lumen. Skylights. A skylight is defined as a glass or other transparent or translucent glazing material installed with a slope of 15 degrees or more from vertical. This would include glazing materials in solariums, sunrooms, roofs, and sloped walls. The U-factor ratings required for skylights is 0 0.60, much different than the 0.35 U-factor required for standard windows and doors. Walls. All walls are not treated the same in the energy code. Therefore, distinguishing between the different types of a wall is essential in determining the proper R-value and insulation requirements that apply. An above-grade wall is a wall that is more than 50% above-grade and enclosing condition space. Understand that above grade walls include the peripheral edges 
of the floors, roofs, and basements, knee walls, dormer walls, gable end walls, and skylight shafts. A basement wall is defined as a wall 50% or more below grade and in closing condition space. Look closely at what the code says. An above grade wall has to exceed 50% above grade, whereas a basement wall is 50% or more below grade. So, if you truly have a 50-50 situation, you will have a basement wall application. Just as important, if these walls are not part of the thermal envelope, then the walls do not have to be insulated. Now, if we look at where energy is lost, obviously Kentucky has a lot of cooling load. Uh, we can see that uh, some of the biggest energy users are, uh, come from two places, um, internal gains, which is the uh, intrinsic gains from our appliances and, and so forth. Uh, and then the second area where we get a lot of heat gain is through windows and doors. The amount of energy from the sun that strikes one square foot of surface is about 250 BTUs per square foot. So if you have a sliding glass door that's roughly 6 by 7, that's roughly 42 square feet. If you just make the math easy and say 40 square feet times 250 BTUs a square foot, that's 10,000 BTUs of energy per hour that's required to be made up by a cooling system. So that's why we pay close attention to glazing and so forth. Uh, in heating, areas that are big energy users, of course, are uh, infiltration. Um, about 30 to 40 percent of an entire home's heating bill can be from infiltration and exfiltration. So for example, as we heat air, that air uh, always wants to go from warmer areas to colder areas, so it wants to escape our structure. And we have to reheat that. In many cases, homes can easily have one or two or more air changes per hour. That means that we have to reheat housefuls of air every hour to compensate for the effects of wind moving air through the structure. Uh, another area that's a big uh, energy user, uh, obviously, uh, in terms of heating costs, is the heat loss through windows and, and doors and skylights, for example. Uh, typically, glazing is not the best insulator in the world, and so it's easier for heat to be lost out of those areas. So they become kind of high on the list, uh, as well as leaks and ductwork. The code pays special attention to that because we're going to have some new ceiling requirements for ductwork because in an average home, you could easily get two to 300 CFM of duct leakage. And so if we were building cars and 25% of the gas leaked out of our gas tanks as our cars went down the road, that would be a bad thing. And so the codes pay special attention to dealing with ductwork. And then uh, uh, finally, we're looking at uh, above, uh, above grade walls, looking at um, how we can do a better job of insulating uh, our walls. Okay, so let's take a look at our value. Our value is basically uh, resistance to heat transfer. What makes an insulator work is its ability to trap air. It's all those air pockets. So for example, if you look at fiberglass insulation, it has thousands and thousands of strands of insulation uh, that actually trap air. It's not the fiberglass itself that is the insulator, it's the air pockets of which the fiberglass creates that reduce the flow of heat. And so that's why it's uh, resistance to heat transfer is what we call R value. So the higher the R value is better. It applies to all walls, raised floors, and roofs. Um, and R values are additive. One of the reasons that we compute R values is because you can add them together. U factors you cannot add together. So U factor is basically a measurement. It's kind of the opposite of R value. It's a measurement of how conductive a material is to heat. In other words, how much heat is transmitted through a material. So for example, a U factor is basically determined by dividing the R value into one. We call that as reciprocal. So the lower the U factor, that means the less conduction, that means you have a better insulating material. So the higher the R value, the better at resisting heat transfer, the lower the U factor it is at reducing the conduction or transmittance of energy through a building component or a material. So we use U factors to uh, uh, help us calculate heating and cooling loads. Uh, it applies to windows and doors, primarily as, as in skylights. So uh, when we see in the code, we rate insulation products by R value, but windows and doors uh, are typically rated by U factor is one of the metrics that we use to determine the performance.